Father God, we thank you. But we right now, in this moment, can be still and know that you are God. In the morning, in the evening, in our coming and in our going, in our frustration, in our isolation, in times of uncertainty, God, you are with us. And over these next few moments, as we open the word, Father God, I pray that you come and again minister to us. We thank you that you've walked with us this week. Thank you for answered prayer. Thank you for being there in the unseen things and the seen things. We pray for Ken, Lord, as he has surgery in just over a week's time. That's tricky. And, and, but we thank you for the wisdom of doctors and, and nurses and specialists. And Lord, bless him as that happens. Be with Wendy and Lester as uh, Joy has settled into retirement village, Lord God. And Father, we pray for that family. We pray for others that are on our hearts and minds at this time. We thank you that our chaplains are able to get back to school and kids and teachers and work and a few more face-to-face -face meetings and working from home and the complexities of life. Lord God, we thank you that as we slowly move out from our homes and, and back to what we now know as normal, Father God, we pray that in our coming and our going, you are indeed with us because you are a great God. A gracious God, a God who goes before and provides a way. Hear our prayer this day, in Jesus' name. Amen. God has a question. To ask us, do you trust me now? Do you trust me now? We get so many opportunities in our life to trust God again and again, and maybe for some of you, oh, not again. <laughs> And every time you trust him on a different level or with a different circumstance or scenario, we get to see a different dimension of who God is and what he can do. Exodus 16, if you want to look there, I'm reading verse 1. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. And on the fifteenth day of the second month, after they had come out of Egypt. So here you have this massive group of people. They've just come out of Egypt where they spent 430 years in Egypt where they initially went to, to escape a famine in Canaan, if you know the story. But then in Egypt, the place that they had escaped to became the place where they were enslaved by Pharaoh. But today, where it brings us is to that place now that they are out of Egypt and they're not in Canaan. They're in, a, they're in a place where they needed God's provision. But they haven't fully accessed the promise of God. I call this the disappointment of deliverance. It when, it's when God brings you out of something, but you're not all the way there yet. That next thing hasn't happened just yet. So you're in the in-between. You're in the middle. It's when you raise your hand to accept Jesus, but you still have issues with your anger. Amen? 
It's when God speaks a word to you regarding your daughter, but her attitude still doesn't change. It's when, when a, a song or a message or a word really, really, really speaks to you and you feel the presence of God and the touch of God, but you still go home with a leap. It's the disappointment of deliverance. When he brings you out and brings you up and moves you forward and, and moves us on. But we're still on the journey and the kids are screaming, are we there yet? Yeah. Why not? So God's people are stuck. They have many concerns, many questions, many fears. And one simple one is, uh, excuse me, uh, what will we eat? A fair question. Where's dinner coming from? How are we going to survive? What are we going to eat? But they move to a place of not being grateful for all that God has done so far. Their gratitude turns to ungratefulness. This is in Bible times. We don't deal with that anymore, do we? You know, times have changed. The Bible's outdated. I don't think so. Everything you go through in your life, things you do to yourself or things that you've experienced, they can't go on forever. And here is why. Here's why it won't go on forever. Whatever that hardship, concern, worry, stress, thing that has happened. Because you are not in charge of the calendar of events that is called the purposes of God in the world. It might be a struggle right now, but it will pass. It's hard, it's lonely, you might feel lost, but eventually one day it'll end. One day it'll get better. Remember the story of Job. God had to give Satan permission to hurt him. Satan doesn't get to do what he likes to us for as long as he likes. For God says, hey, that's enough. That's enough. I hope that's a word for you this morning. God says that's enough. Enough pain, enough, enough sickness, enough disappointment, enough worry, enough stress. God says, hey, that's enough. When God saw his people struggling and suffering and dying under the Egyptian slave masters, friends, what did he say? Yep, that's enough. He saw their misery. He heard their cries. He was very concerned. And he came down and he delivered his people and set them free because that was enough. Every season of suffering, every struggle, every hardship has a use by date. Because God is sovereign and God is in charge. He's turning the page. It's a new day. Set my people free. My life is in God's hands. Your life is in God's hands. Under His guidance and control. For He is a great and gracious God. Their suffering ended and they came through the Red Sea. And now they need something to eat. Remember Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Just like I did it back then, I can do it again. I've taken care of you before, I can do it again. I was, I am, I will be. There is a testimony in your life to the faithfulness and gratefulness and thankfulness of God. God, that will enable you to trust Him once again. Trust Him once again. Trust Him another day, another week, another year. Trust Him deeper and wider and higher. You thought you'd arrived, but sorry, the job is not finished just yet. It was just the beginning. I saw this during the week up on the screen there. 
Long before you face a problem, God already has a plan. For He is a great God. Long before, long before, friends, He knows what He's up to. Back to Exodus, verse 2. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Oh, I wish that read differently. I wish it said everyone was so thankful. Everyone was so grateful and appreciated all the sacrifice and the hard work that Moses and Aaron had done for all of them and kept them alive and helped them and brought them through out of Egypt. But no, they grumbled, they complained, not a few, the whole community. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of noise. <laughs> that doesn't happen in church, does it? <laughs> People forgot so quickly, didn't they? They grumbled. People forget so quickly. They always seem to focus on what is missing. And then they tend to have a selective memory. It's amazing because sometimes what keeps you from trusting God in, in the present is your attachment to the past. Write that one down, Joan. <laughs> because sometimes what keeps you from trusting God in the present is your attachment to the past. You've been gone from Egypt a while. But you remember it very differently. And what it was really like. It's called selective memory. Now some of us have selective hearing. I'm not asking you for a show of hands. Just ask your wife. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, but some of us do. It's verse 3. We've come a long way so far, haven't we? Three verses. Then the Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. Yep, the angel of death, the plagues, you know. Oh, only we died in Egypt. There, friends, we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you brought us up out into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Honestly. Oh, remember how we sat around those pots of meat? Oh, glorious. And that amazing, all you can eat buffet! Uh, excuse me, um, how quickly they forgot the beatings. How quickly they forgot the hard labour and the cruelty of the slave masters. Um, where do you think those scars on your back came from? Uh, excuse me? Working 20 hours a day? How quickly they were narrow. Minded, how quickly they forgot. But you forget that, and they chose what was familiar over freedom. Wish we were back in Egypt, friends, sitting around enjoying that brisket and mashed potato. But no, you brought us up out into the desert to starve all of us to death. And we're going to die. Sometimes the people you try to help the most will just turn on you. Then the Lord said to Moses, right then, I'm going to kill them all. For some of you, that's how you grow up. Well, for some of you, maybe that's how you picture God. That He will punish you. And He'll strike you dead. And He's out to get you. But then Jesus enters our world and gives us a greater picture of God's goodness and grace. 
He is a great and gracious God. He is not harsh and hard. He is the giver of life and hope. God is the provider, Jehovah Jireh. And over time, we see his grace, we see his goodness, and we get a greater picture of God. Because he is enough. But in the past, maybe it was hard for you. Where you saw God as someone who was here, who was hard, who was harsh, who was here to keep you in line and to bring you punishment. And you were never going to have any fun on planet Earth. And that's a difficult place to move on from. from. Only by his hand of grace on your life. Chipping away, chipping away, and creating something new. Until you get to that place where you cannot do it anymore, and God is all you've got. Embrace Him. Give thanks for Him. It's like the prodigal son. Dad is, is down the end of that road. Down the end of that road there waiting. Waiting for his child to come home. And he sees him. And he meets him. And he embraces him. And he says, come home, my child. My grace is enough. My forgiveness is enough. My provision is enough. My mercy is enough. Come and eat. I will provide again. I will provide again. I will provide again. He gives his people grace for their grumbling. This is the real verse 4. He didn't kill them. He didn't strike them dead. The earth didn't open up and swallow them. He came for he is a gracious God and a God who provides and a God who goes the extra mile when we are in need. Verse 4 of Exodus 16. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven. Baker's delight. Amazing. <laughs> the people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way I'll test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. I'm going to give them bread from heaven and feed them and provide for them. Even though they, they grumbled, even though they complained, even though their vision was a bit foggy and they wanted their pots of meat, I will feed them, I will clothe them, I will care for them, for I am their God. He tested them to see if they would trust Him. Do you trust me enough to believe I am enough? I am your God. And I'll never put you in a situation where I will not provide or give you what you need to get through. Circumstances may change, but our God does not. So come. Come let us, Hebrews 4, as we finish this morning. Let us come. Boldly to the throne of our gracious God. I pray this message has blessed you. I pray that God has spoken to you. I pray that you've been reminded that He is enough, that you can trust Him, whatever the twists and turns. Let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. God bless you. Amen.